Emmanuel Houston coming live from New York City. More about him in just a minute. Let everyone welcome to the season finale, episode 12 of Designing on the Front Lines. This show is co sponsored by the Health Design Lab here at Thomas Jefferson University Hospital and from Cooper Hewitt at the Smithsonian Design Museum. I'm Morgan Hutchinson. Hey, and I'm Matt Fields, and we are two emergency medicine doctors here in beautiful Philadelphia, where we also get to hang out in the Health Design Lab. And speaking of which, it being our final episode, I really want to thank all of the people that make it possible for us to be here. First of all, to all of you uh, for tuning in every week and joining in the discussion. And to our team, uh, our director, Bon Ku, our managing director and producer, Rob Puglisi, Christy Schein, Mary Ellen Daly, and our students as always. And a special shout out to somebody who's always been there behind the scenes, helping to make things happen, Eric Backlund. Uh, we really appreciate all your work. Sadly for Eric, it was also his last day in the lab with us. Uh, he's moving on to some other things, and so we're going to miss you, Eric. And from Cooper Hewitt, Ellen Lupton, and Pam Horn. It's July 31st, and this is the last episode of season one of Designing on the Front Lines. We're so happy to have cultivated such an energetic and inspiring audience and such talented and motivating speakers. On behalf of Health Design Lab and Cooper Hewitt, thank you so much for joining us. 
That's right. And the impetus for this series really started with the pandemic and PPE and ended up spanning into so many topics. It was so awesome. After today, we'll have heard from nearly 40 different speakers over 12 weeks. What an awesome run. We have made so many new friends across the country and across, across the globe, and we have all shared ideas and inspiration about how we might design for health and create a quality access and safety in a system where it doesn't always exist. We've had greater than 1,600 signups over the last 12 episodes, and we've had guests from the US, Canada, Mexico, Scotland, Ireland, Australia, Italy, South Africa, England, and more. That's right. And while we are coming to an end for our season, we hope that everyone here will continue to collaborate and work together to build better products, spaces, and services for inside and outside of healthcare, especially as we all continue to push through this pandemic together. Please share with us your feedback. We would love to hear from you by email, social media, or on the survey. We are about to drop it right into the chat box, so please let us know what you think. Let's get started. Our guests today include designer from New York City, Mia Osaki. Doctor and service designer in Scotland, Ijoma Azoru, and designer from California, Natasha Margo Blum. We also welcome, of course, uh, musician Emmanuel Houston. That's right. And as always, we're going to have one theme five minute breakout room where you'll get to meet, uh, meet each other and get to say hi. And remember, we want to see your smiling faces. So turn your video on, please. Use the chat box, say who you are, where you're from, and give a shout out. And again, uh, put your questions for the speakers or any questions you have in the chat box. And uh, time permitting, we'll try to get to those, but in real time, hopefully people will be able to address your questions in the chat. And if you've missed any of our previous episodes, healthdesignlab.com slash DOTFL. We have all the first 11 episodes posted, and we'll post this one shortly after uh, the episode ends. Um, Rob, I am dying to hear more about our wonderful uh, musician, Emmanuel Houston. Right, so um, actually, you know what? I'm gonna save that for the end because I wanna intro him properly right before. He, Manny's gonna uh, be here with us uh, at the very end with the set. If you have any suggestions or some, some music you'd like uh, uh, Emmanuel to play, he is incredibly talented and I wanna see him in action. So drop any music suggestions that you wanna hear him sing in the chat box and I'll tell you more about him right before his set. All right, well, if we must wait for the intro, we will go straight to um, Senior Curator from the Smithsonian Design Museum and Cooper Hewitt, Ellen Lupton for Design Find of the Week. Hi there, I'm really excited to tell you about voting. And it turns out you can register to vote in the emergency room. And this is made possible by Dr. Alistair Martin at Mass General Hospital, who has started a program to register voters oh. in the ER. And he points out that there are over 50 million eligible voters in the US who are not registered. The ma majority of them are people of color coming and people coming from low income communities. And he sees that a lot of the problems in the ER are problems stemming from failure of policy. And the only way we can change those policies is to vote. Um, and so this is a kiosk where people waiting in the ER can in 90 seconds um, sign up to vote, to register to vote or to find out if they are already so cool. registered. And um, also there are posters all through the hospital with touch lists text number or QR code for doing the same thing on your own telephone. And if you are an individual healthcare provider who wants to help people register to vote while you're on the job, you can get for free from Vote ER this incredible lanyard with a kind of ID card with yourself on it and a QR code that lets people just scan your QR code and register to vote and they will make this customized for you, for your community for free and send it to you. <laughs> so it's That's kind so of cool. an amazing <laughs> um, project um, and you can learn more about it on this website um, and learn more about the incredible team of designers and doctors and healthcare providers um, who made it all possible. So, uh, so thank you, enjoy that. Thank you so much, Ellen. It's super important for us to, you know, expand voting and make sure everybody gets registered. Um, now, without further ado, I'd like, like to, to... I'd like to point out that you don't have to go to the emergency department just to vote. Okay. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. That's a good point. 
You can, but you don't have to. Um, so now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Mia Osaki. Mia is a partner and co-founder of Diagram, a New York City-based design studio focused on improving healthcare experience and health outcomes using patient-centered solutions. She's also the chair of the MFA Design for Social Innovation program at the School of Visual Arts in New York City and a career-long health design thinker. If you want to hear more about her and from her after this episode, you can check out our podcast, which is called Yeah, No. I'm going to share a link shortly in the chat box. Mia, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's so great to be here. Let me share my screen. Um, let's see if I can get this full screen now. How's that? Is that okay? Okay, I'm sorry, everyone. Um, I'm so honored to be in this conversation with um, Natasha and Ijoma. So, um, and thank you, Designing on the Front Lines, um, Morgan, Matt, Bon, Rob, Ellen, and the Health Design Lab team for off offering this opportunity to gather together during this time. Um, my name is Mia Osaki. I've worked in healthcare design for over 10 years, and I'm going to talk about some thoughts I'm having right now around healthcare design. Um, they are um, in the formation, and I'm opening this up for um, conversation and questions. Um, and I've just been thinking about where design is headed. Um, this concept of with, designing with and not designing for, is the work of the Disability List. Um, they're a group that I've been working with. They're fantastic. Um, and I'll talk to you more about this as we go on. Um, I am an experienced designer, which is a pretty broad title um, to say that I've always been interested in people and the experiences that people have and how design can bring us together. Um, I'm spending my time, as Morgan mentioned, um, in three spaces currently. I'm co-founder of Diagram with my business partner, Tina Park. Um, I think she's on the call uh, on this right now. Um, hi, Tina. Uh, Diagram is a, a healthcare design studio, and we've spent the last seven years really looking at how design um, can improve healthcare experiences. We work with healthcare companies, hospitals, sometimes individual doctors, tech companies to ensure that the voices of those impacted by healthcare are a part of the process. Um, and so, um, as many of these conversations we've had here are about, it's about looking at uh, and understanding people before a technology or a solution. Um, and so some of the work we're doing right now is with people living um, with lung disease, they've experienced heart failure, disability, youth with type 2 diabetes. We've been working with a group called the Patient Revolution, who are really incredible. Um, and we're sickle cell disease and cancer. Um, I'm also chair of, of the Design for Social Innovation graduate program. Um, and we host this podcast um, called Beyond No, Tina and I, where we, we do talk through these ideas and we uh, find amazing people who are willing to talk with us and we um, just use it as a platform to think through healthcare and design. And like many of you, um, recently I've been really rethinking and, and considering the consequences that we're going through right now with, um, in this serious health and cultural crisis that we're in today. Um, COVID-19, the losses that we've all experienced, the violence and the systemic oppression against our black communities, um, and really thinking about the recognition that current systems are not serving us. Um, and healthcare is one of them. And so we're able to now really have language and talk about these racial and social divides, which have been happening for a long time. Um, it's not equitable. And so now that we know it, what are we gonna do about it? Um, so another consideration that's come out of this space that we're in today is this idea of a third space. So whereas a lot of our work in human-centered design has been looking at the home, like healthcare in the home, because it doesn't always happen in the clinic, now we have a third space. Um, and this space is not the clinic, it's not the home, yet it will be a portal between both of those. Um, and so what, how, what is this gonna look like? How are we gonna ensure that it is equitable? How do we ensure that it's an opportunity to provide care in a way that is better and helps more people um, and that we're really challenging uh, assumptions about status quo and designing this in, in a way that's interesting. So this is also kind of informing my work. Um, uh, my background is in human-centered design um, and that's been centered around collaborating and listening and empathizing and prototyping, um, knowing that care does not happen just in the clinic. So we talk, we do interviews, um, co-design activities um, with people in their homes. Um, 
and now that we're uh, online, we've been doing it online um, in new ways. Um, we also realize and acknowledge that care is not just about health. So there are invisible and visible things that impact um, people's ability to um, access care. Um, and uh, so we do activities that help to people to self-reflect and, and uh, help us understand that better. Um, but I'm starting to think, and this is the, the thinking part, is that um, it, these processes may not be serving us well. Um, so even something like empathy has gaps and blind spots. Um, it can introduce your biases. So you're listening, but you still have, it's still your perspective. Um, and it can erase the experiences of the people who we're, we're really wanting to help. Um, so we bring someone in who has a health experience, we do an interview or um, have them at a co-design, we gather their feedback and then we say thank you and we take that and it becomes ours as the designers. Um, so can we admit that maybe this is, there's something that's not quite right about that. Um, so we're still in a little bit of a design bubble. We've been talking about code creation and participatory design. But I think that it's time to broaden, expand, and think about other methods. Um, so our current methods can still perpetuate and continue the assumptions and the biases that are just status quo um, because we're building upon these and they have a long fraught history. Um, if we're seeking a different future, then we need to break the cycle and find new approaches. So um, if design, instead of as a process, is a practice, as a practice, design can improve. Um, so I've been working with some amazing people in the interest of time. I'm, I wish I could talk all day about them. I would love to, um, but I'm putting their website big so that you can go and visit. Um, uh, this is the disabled list, um, and this is Liz Jackson and Alex Haggard. They have been incredible um, influencers in thinking about how do we uh, design with uh, people, disabled people. Um, they've got this cultural model of disability, which moves us from a medical and social model. They're incredible. Um, and we just did a project in with a technology company um, in accessibility. And this working with them um, has been transformational in my, my thinking about design and what design can do. Um, Sloan Leo is, um, has been doing work in community um, building as a design practice, um, looking at um, the strengths and the assets and, and the, the, the um, ways that communities can come together and, and challenge power and, and, um, and be able to build more equitable approaches for design. So if you um, check out Sloan and their work. Um, and the Creative Reaction Lab, which I did a workshop with them last summer and they really um, have expanded the frame of human-centered design to say that if you're working with people with lived experience, you cannot just drop them in a room and say, co-design with us, you know? And so they've been developing some really incredible practices. And I think this is just the beginning. So um, I, these, these groups are not specifically doing healthcare work, but I think that tangentially, and I would love to bring this work into healthcare more directly um, because I think there's a lot to learn. Um, I am a designer. I love to make things, but I'm realizing now that we're, we might be just starting off on the wrong path um, to begin with. So how can we start off on a different pathway? Um, and so this, all this work is informing my design practice in healthcare, doing work that's more equitable, that can sustain, that really cares. So these are two areas which I think could start us off in a new place. And I would love to just, I don't have all the answers, but um, these are some prompts. So really starting with the who and the how, they're the same letters. They're just, <laughs> just in different order. Who, who are we collaborating with? Are we collaborating with people who have the experience? Who has the knowledge? Um, Alex and Liz talk about in disability-led design, this idea of knowledgeable fearlessness, which means that you're not saying, are we doing design correctly? But we're saying, what are the possibilities? What, what, what's possible for us? Who has a role beyond just being included? So there's a lot of language around inclusivity and, and, and diversity, but really, should the whole practice be kind of from the beginning be um, you know, looked at as how do we give and offer um, more involvement um, throughout the process so that it's not just a one-time one um, deal. 
So who are the communities that we're serving? Are we working with them? Uh, are we addressing the power and finding ways to create equity? Are our teams and leadership, this is a big one, um, equitable? So they're cross-disciplinary, cross-backgrounds, cross-perspective. Um, we need to do a better job at this. Um, and then the how, have we taken up have we taken the time to set this up? And I'm just saying this because I've been in a couple projects recently that had to stop and start because of, of what's going on in the world. Um, and then they just race to the finish line. And I think some of this practice around um, sprints and doing things quickly and failing fast has set us up for not, again, not preparing ourselves to do the work that's hard and it takes some time. So I wanna ask for more time to really challenge and sustain. So we're doing things so we understand the context. We make sure that we're not doing more harm by trying to kind of race ahead. So it's gonna be this balance, I think, in design because we've been, we've been in this mindset of like, do it quickly in two weeks. Um, so uh, what are the stories? What are new ways to measure success? What forces are at play? Are we comfortable with being uncomfortable? And that's my, my last point. Um, so in this day, I hope that we've, we're learning um, I would love to do more. I'd love to talk to anyone who's interested. You can reach me either at diagramoffice.com or through SDA, through Design for Social Innovation. And thank you so much for listening. I'm excited for today. Thank you so much, Mia. That was awesome. And like I had told you before when we were chatting earlier, I think like it's such an important conversation. We could have a whole series just about this and it fits in, I think, so well with what we've been talking about. So I really appreciate you coming on. I'm going to hold the questions for the end. So hopefully we have some time um, for audience questions. It is time to introduce our second speaker, Ijoma Azoto. Ijoma is a general surgeon and she's associate director for clinical and health service design at the National Digital Services in Scotland. Using her clinical expertise, she also helps doctors and healthcare organizations better use technology, analytics, and artificial intelligence to provide empathetic quality and high value and sustainable healthcare. Ajoma, thanks so much for joining us today. I'm very excited to hear from you. Yeah, good, perfect. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about designing with care and uh, really thinking about it from the different lenses within which I look at design and the different things that we are seeing here during the pandemic. Um, it's gonna take uh, this idea of design really being something that's transdisciplinary. Um, something that's experiential, it's social, and it's practical. Um, I've recently learned that I was a designer, um, whereas I was looking at, at things from a public health approach. So really um, things around protecting health, improving health, and looking at quality care and services. Um, because of my background, I trained as a cancer and transplant surgeon in Scotland, which is what brought me to Scotland. And so I use essentially a surgical approach to things is um, how do you do things um, with the patients, for the patients, um, look at the systems that were taking care of people, um, and also work uh, quite a lot behind the scenes. Uh, we use data a lot in that. We work with different communities of people. And then also recently adding the ways in which we use technology to do things at pace and scale and to spread that across the systems of care and practice that we have. Um, so, you know, my, my design background is uh, just surgical practice, which is uh, get things done. Um, in, in Scotland, they would say just crack on with your work. Um, I'm a health services re researcher, so really interested in the things that we're doing for patients. Is that something that has value to them? Is that according to a standard of care and practice? And is the impact something that's desirable for them and the system? That requires me to also be an educator, storyteller, technologist, and really think about the systems within which I work and care for people. And so if I take us back to um, Scotland, the map here is uh, on the right hand side is Scotland and at the top of the map is kind of where we are. I'm in Edinburgh, which is close to that pin drop there. Um, but right now we're working in phase three and in phase three, our, our policy is around looking at facts, um, face masks, avoiding crowds, keeping your hands clean, um, trying to um, uh, isolate and get tested if you have, have symptoms. That's sort of the advice that we're working on and looking forward to um, restarting school or reopening school. Um, the 11th of August, I believe, is the date. 
I think one of the things from the public health approach when I was looking at what, what was happening and how people were learning about how to look after themselves and others was what was happening in, in the public and how things were becoming proximate to them. So where, where do people look for expert information? Where's a trusted voice? And what are the ways in which we can look to meet people where they are? Um, and so Captain Tom Moore, um, he is a military uh, member, retired now, but he's reaching, I think, almost age 100. He raised, I think, at the end, over 20 million pounds for the NHS. And he also was knighted uh, by the Queen. And so he had decided to, to walk 100 lengths of his garden to raise money for the NHS, because people within the UK, the four nations are really able to rally around the NHS as part of our public health message. So this was something that people were able to subscribe to. When I looked at things coming across from the US, I was intrigued at the way um, different celebrity voices were talking about how to protect themselves, protect others, and sharing that information. So I have a picture of Tom, and, Tom Hanks and Rita Wilson here, who I think is also Tom Hanks is known as America's dad um, and looking to some of his tweets and information again as a way for people to bring that to bring the pandemic proximate to them. Um, I thought about my childhood in Nigeria and so I was intrigued by this third uh, tweet which is of a classroom in Ghana and if you can read some of the words is that they'd choreographed a dance to a song and I think that I still remember some of the um, songs and dances that were used to teach me um, health and education uh, when I was a youth in Nigeria. So it was interesting to see the different ways in which you could communicate with people to bring this information proximate to them um, so that they could sign on to that, um, that message and that lesson. Ooh. And then the next, um, looking at systems, structures, and representation. Um, I have a variety of things here. I was quite intrigued at the way um, everything about the operating theater was coming outside the operating theater. Um, so looking at the ways in, in which uh, people were designing spaces for optimal flow, separating clean from dirty areas in terms of receiving the intensive care, all things that were quite, I would say, normal to me, but unusual to see outside of theater. So here in the top right corner, I have this red line. And once people, once you cross the red line, you're in sort of theater world. You have equipment, you have shoes, you have masks, you have all kinds of different um, things you have to wear and systems and structures that you, that you follow, that a lot of them are color coded. Um, communication is, is done um, uh, a bit differently. There's a lot of visual signage and coloring to allow you to know where to go. So I was intrigued, these bottom two um, images that I've shown here are marks outside the supermarket. So you can see these white hash marks here, which is where people are standing um, six feet apart. And also the actual measuring tape for people to know um, when they are six, six feet apart. Um, this is a picture of me um, in a mask that I had made. Um, I'd done some research on what were non-operative masks because I just couldn't, didn't want to have to wear surgical mask outside of theater. Um, so I had, I had one made that's two layers of different uh, weaving of material um, after, as you do, doing some academic research uh, to see what's practical. Um, and this is me out and about on a different sunny, sunny day in Scotland. You might be able to see the Edinburgh Castle in the background of the picture. Uh, finally, the third approach looks at some of the ways in which um, we saw pace and scale and thread. Um, there's a feature called NHS Near Me. And that is something that in the north of Scotland grew out of a quality project um, uh, of one of the clinicians up there. And this telehealth, um, uh, telehealth feature that was really being used only in the north of Scotland. And so it was really great to see the ways in which this was adopted across the entire NHS um, within a very short period of time. And one of the things that made that um, easy to do was that everyone 
just needed to get on the same system, uh, something that we were doing slowly over time. But because we're all part of NHS Scotland, um, we have 14 health boards which are divided across 14 regions in the country. Um, my division is within a special health board that includes things like our public health system, the Scottish Ambulance Service, we were able to essentially just switch everything on for everybody to do teleconsultations and share that information. And so we were able to connect our community and resources. Um, the last thing I'll show you briefly is some of the work that our team did um, around people who are asked to shield, so people who are at higher risk of having adverse health events um, due to COVID. Um, one of the commissions that we picked up was to help create a system uh, to support uh, people who've been asked to shield. Um, so there was over 180,000 people who were eligible for shielding. Um, they received a letter from the chief medical officer, which instructed us, instructed them to get in touch with our service. Um, they registered for this SMS-based service. And um, in total, as we wind down the service, we were able to deliver almost 100, uh, almost um, 1 million grocery boxes to people across Scotland um, and coordinate priority shopping for people who, again, um, were asked not to leave home um, due to the pandemic. Um, and so this brings together, again, a lot of the community and ecosystem resources that we have. Uh, about digital access and infrastructure, we put some of that information into deciding how we would how we would build our system, and then using the um, resources of our local authorities to do that last mile. To people who weren't able um, uh, to participate in the SMS Shield, um, and for other reasons um, couldn't sign on, but again to make sure that we're able to connect our community and ecosystem resources. Um, I'll close with this, uh, this quote that I saw recently. Uh, we are landscape of all we have seen. Uh, within our team, we have service, service designers. We have clin clinical service designers like myself, informaticians, uh, technologists, developers, and software engineers. And so this is a fantastic experiment of different perspectives that we're bringing to healthcare in order to understand what people in and communities need uh, to, deliver, to deliver that uh, an ecosystem of a nation really um, and so you know I'll close with with this and it's and it's also a question similarly similar to my previous uh, speaker posed is that you know we're trying to do a lot of of achieve this place-based proximity when things are emergingly low touch and where a lot of things are going to digital and so how are we doing that well are we doing that well um, how do we ma map this whole landscape and structure so that we can best communicate with people and really understand the gaps in what we're doing? When we think about pace and scale um, and things that are sustainable, you know, what are the necessary cons considerations do we need to ba balance that speed and novelty with sustainability and really design with our whole ecosystem and landscape in mind, its individuals, its collectives, um, and its systems and structures. And I'm particularly interested in the way that digital is also an infrastructure that doesn't actually exist, um, but is part of one of those um, determinants of health. Um, so thank you all for your time. Very happy to take any questions. Um, Thank you so much, Ijoma. That was awesome. It's so great to hear from you. Um, there are a ton of questions that are coming up in the chat box, so I want to save some time for us to ask the audience questions at the end. Um, but thank you to everybody for asking those questions. And next, we're going to jump back eight time zones uh, for our, our third speaker. I'd like to introduce Ellen Lupton, the Senior Curator at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, to introduce our last speaker. Okay, well, wow. For the last 12 weeks, we've been talking about how to improve the design of our hospitals, our PPE, and a society burdened by racism. Today, Natasha Blum will talk with us about the end of life. Wow, this is intense. <laughs> she is working with the Emergency Design Collective to confront death, dying, and COVID-19 what happens to COVID-19 patients and their families when all our best efforts to prevent and treat this disease are not enough? What she is doing is so important. This is love. This is healthcare. 
And this is uh, Natasha, welcome. Thank you so much, Ellen, for that beautiful introduction. And, and thank you everyone, Matt, Morgan, Robert, Vaughn. I know I'm gonna forget somebody else. Thank you all so much for this critically important conversation um, and for having me today. So bear with me as I uh, get set up here. Hopefully we'll move swiftly. All right, how's that going? Thumbs up, title screen, cool, great. Um, so just an, an introduction. So I lead an innovation studio called Blumline, um, and I see my colleagues here. Thanks to everyone from the studio and my emergency design collective colleagues and other end of life colleagues. Thanks for, for all uh, being here. So this is, um, I'll give you a little bit of an introduction to our work and then we'll dive right in. So um, we, uh, I lead an integrated studio and we're really focused on health and well-being. Uh, we work across healthcare and medicine. We also do design education, but it really all comes down to health for us. That's the lens. Um, and we focus in a couple different areas, uh, education, insights, and strategy, and design and innovation. We work globally with amazing clients. We are so fortunate and an amazing collective of incredibly talented people. We work with some of these folks um, across medicine, and we use a human-centered design process, process excuse me, um, bolstered uh, with systems design and foresight strategy. So when shelter in place hit here in March, I got a text from a colleague uh, and he said, there's a group forming, you need to be on this call. Uh, and I said, okay. And it was a convergence of design thinkers, leaders, physicians, academics working in health innovation uh, to discuss and strategize how we might um, collaborate cross institutionally and form working teams to solve the challenges of the pandemic. Um, so I brought in my team from Blumline to help bolster our colleagues uh, at the Emergency Design Collective. And there are many of us working on this incredible project. It really does take a village. Um, as we dove into the challenges for COVID-19, there were a ton of, ton of spaces we could have tackled. But when we were thinking about the future, there were clearly a group of us that knew that death is not avoidable in this instance. Uh, we do need to tackle this from all sides. But for us, we really leaned in and said, this is going to happen no matter what. So let's try to come up with solutions and understand the real, the real needs. Excuse me. Um, we knew that COVID-19 would take hundreds of thousands of lives, right? We have, we've had to revise this number over and over. <laughs> At first it was 50 and 130 and now 150. Our provocation here is how might we design for this uniquely challenging period to support the dying, their families and loved ones, uh, the medical system providing care and communities and grieving. That was where we started. One of the quotes we heard during our research, uh, we've done over 35 in-depth interviews and feedback sessions uh, with stakeholders, experts, uh, and people working in the field of palliative care and hospice, um, was I couldn't tell you how many 90-year-olds I've given CPR. Um, anyone who works uh, in medicine and in the emergency room or ICU knows the importance of medical interventions and specifying your care needs, um, but this hit us really hard, especially when staff is already overwhelmed, um, we certainly don't need uh, any extra burden on them. A few stats to bolster this. Um, we know the death count, 48 years old, median age of US COVID sufferer. 36.7% um, uh, is the number of, is the percentage of people who have worked on their advanced directives, which means two thirds of Americans are not prepared for their own emergency medical care. Um, 51 years, this is the amount of time uh, the death anxiety scale has been used in the field of psychology. So death anxiety is not new, but it is certainly relevant as we try to tackle this in the coming months and years. Um, my colleague and I from the Emergency Design Collective, David Jenka, we co-wrote um, a piece you can find on Medium that will explain our insights and the opportunity areas in depth. This is really just a snapshot. Um, and I'll share a few of the key themes here. Um, one is uh, rapid unpredictability. 
um, we're seeing, you know, isolated, scaled, accelerated deaths. You know, the window, window from healthy to sick is incredibly short and COVID is very unpredictable. And we've really got to adapt palliative care and hospice to this rapid pace. Um, also, might this be an opportunity for our culture to meaningfully engage with death as a collective experience? Um, two, complex decision-making. Um, these are all really micro moments, right? Um, another key dimension is emotional and logistical decisions. Um, another is that we tend to view death as failure rather than normal. Um, and that's a problem when we deliver care. Um, unknowns also abound. So it's really making decisions is incredibly difficult because it's practically blind sometimes. And the last point here is that no decision is a decision in itself. Um, and that's hard for most people to grok. Adaptive communication. Um, we lack a lot of language and the, and the correct meaning to understand each other when we talk about things involving death, which is really challenging. Um, there's also this double-edged sword of technology-enabled communication, and there's a problem with unlocking access to communication. Anticipatory anxiety and avoidance of death and dying. Um, this anxiety precipitates avoidance. Um, Legacy also precedes paperwork on the journey toward acceptance. And we lack exemplary good models or even great models of death, which is a huge problem. And the last key theme area is authentic presencing. And this is about uh, use, learning to use our presence in ways uh, beyond the immediately obvious. So remote palliative care and distance grieving are not new. People are doing this exceptionally well, um, but it's about creating space to process, which creates uh, more connection. And that's something we need to skill up collectively in this area. This is a journey map we made that outlines uh, the pathway of dying from COVID if you do go into the hospital. And we created this for the community to build on and share. And so we hope you'll take a closer look at this and let us know what you think. Um, but really, this shows that once somebody does go into the hospital, uh, if they have COVID, uh, their agency decreases significantly. And our goal is to really increase agency for everyone so that they can get the care that they need um, and want. And But that requires facing a lot of these fears of talking and thinking about it. So we have a, a few uh, opportunity areas here. <clears throat> Dying in a time of crisis is about leveraging the moment. Um, the medium is the magic, magic, and that is about breaking barriers to entry. Um, celebrating life to prepare for death, reframing the conversation. And remote participation in dying and grieving, connecting one apart. Um, this one, I, I think, hits people the hardest, the thought of people dying alone, of not being with loved ones. And we've seen these stories of um, doctors and clinicians stepping up and creating that space for loved ones to connect if possible. Um, <clears throat> we particularly decided to focus on this last section, uh, sorry, the uh, conversation section, um, because that is the area that enables people, uh, that agency that we're most concerned about, that has the largest impact and that's what we were looking for. So I'm gonna share just a few more examples of um, some of the prototyping that we did building on this opportunity space. Um, we really probed a lot around language and around who is appropriate to deliver this message um, and to encourage people to think about end of life. It is very contentious within the medical community, uh, the uh, appropriateness of, of doing this. Um, in our learnings, uh, we wound up uh, on something called famous last Words. And this is a very brief introduction, again, on a very large topic, so um, bear with me. But uh, this is a prototype that we are currently testing right now in diary studies and in interviews. Um, and it is a collective self-discovery ritual. And we are putting this really in the hands of people um, and also clinicians who can send this to their populations. Um, but the, the aim here is to prepare us. We don't have a rite of passage for this. There is no rite of passage for what we're going through right now. And I think that is the largest insight 
that COVID-19 will deliver across the board. And it's especially relevant when we think about our legacy and what we wanna be known for, how we wanna be cared for and how we wanna be remembered. And in the process, it'll also help all of us know how we wanna live. And that is, I think, the greatest impact that we can have. So we've especially honed in on uh, intubation on some of the interventions in a way that feels more human, that feels more relatable. Uh, we've built in emotional regulation techniques throughout this prototype to help combat some of the anxiety and fear and lack of familiarity with this. Um, and we've created a workbook that's interactive and we are soliciting feedback on this from both clinicians and people. And um, that's a little bit about what we've been working on and the angle that we've taken. Uh, this is from a presentation I did just before the lockdown and I saw it again and I thought, is that true anymore? I think there is. I mean, it's gonna be drawn out, but there just might be. And I really hope, um, you know, we're building on, we're standing on the shoulders of giants. People have been doing this work in palliative care and end of life for a long time. And we are just trying to lift all of their work up and synthesize it. And we hope that this might be an opportunity for us to engage collectively in a way that we never have that can um, empower us all. And here's my community ask. Uh, if anyone would like to give us feedback, try this out, please let me know. If you know collaborators and partners, let us know. If you know fiscal sponsors, let us know. And otherwise, um, across the board health, if you wanna talk surgery, diagnostics, remote health, please get in touch. Um, it's been such a joy to connect with this community and to hear more about um, what all of you are working on, Mia and Ijeomi. So um, thank you so much for letting me share and, and I'll stop there today. Ellen, you're muted. Maybe I should be. <laughs> Hi, so do I have time for a couple questions, Morgan? I think we have time for one question. Yeah, we do. I would love to have an extra um, hour of this, but. Yeah, so I mean, there's just so much. It's, it's so amazing what you've been talking about. Can you just tell us a little more about distance grieving and what um, new processes or practices you've seen people develop in this crisis? Yeah, there, there are two important points there. One is that um, distance grieving, <clears throat> I think, the the grieving process can be anticipatory is one thing another is that we learn there are different traditions where um it's really important to note that there is no one window i think this is the most important thing people feel like there's one window to grieve if i miss the memorial i'm missing the whole thing and we're seeing that this has to shift right if somebody misses the email and the memorial happens in four hours um, that doesn't need to happen. There can be other events. And so spacing it out and having this time of unveiling like there is in the Jewish tradition that can last up to a year after, that's a great opportunity for people to space it out. Other remote grieving that we wanted to share is just that you don't have to write a poem or conduct the ceremony. You can participate in whichever way you like. And that's been really empowering for people to say, I don't wanna talk, I'll, I'll make the playlist or I'll handle the tech or I'll do something else to care um, for my family so we can all grieve together. So those are some of, I think, the novel ways that um, don't involve technology, they just involve a little thought and, and care and ingenuity. Thank you, I'll, I'll hand it back to Morgan. Thank you so much. Thank you so Thank much, you. Natasha. You guys 100% chose the right thing to focus on. I'm so glad that you're doing this work and it definitely hits close to home in the emergency department where we all are doctors. So speaking of emergency doctors, I would like to make sure that we get time for a question for each of our other speakers as well. So I'm gonna turn it over to Christy Shine so we can get a couple audience questions. Great. Thanks so much, Morgan. Wow. Excellent presentations today. And thanks to everybody who asked so many wonderful questions in the chat. I'm so sorry we don't get to all of them. But a question uh, let's uh, ask of uh, Mia. So Mia, uh, this comes from Ellen Lepton and Nina Gregg kind of combining their questions. But what are the methods for working with and not for others? And how, I, how might we encourage or mandate behavioral changes for individuals who have not followed the rules, for example, of wearing masks or keeping social distancing? 
Those are two big questions. Um, the first know. one is, it really goes back to the who, like who, who are you including in, in this um, process? I think that's a very simple one that we, I think we can all challenge ourselves to expand um, our view of who, who can be involved. I think that, that design sometimes will open up or allow for times when we're co-designing, but you know, it's like the, are, what is the role? Are we, are we going to continue this? Are we going to do continuous, you know, involvement? Are we going to set up the team in a structure? Are we going to have a community agreement about how we persist in our collaboration together? I think that's really important. And I would say that the behavior may, you may discover what's happening in the behavior. If you understand, you know, you've got people who are actually the ones who are supposed to be using that final if it's mask wearing, um, I think it's really, I don't know about the governance of it. I think that there's a design exploration in, in that alone, but there's, there's definitely, do you know why people don't want to? And um, is what, what is, what's happening there? And then, you know, understanding what's their participation and moving forward with, with coming, you know, coming up with ways to address it. That's great. Thank you so much. And our final question for Ijeoma. Um, so many great comments and questions about the concept of proximal. Um, and around that, we heard you say that there was 10 years of change in Scotland in one week. And as we tend to think about various barriers that people might face, for example, if you're in the countryside in Scotland or even in Texas or another place, you might not have internet access, or if you're 90, you might not know how to work telehealth. So how do we help patients and healthcare professionals adapt? And what's been working well in Scotland and what hasn't been working so well? Yeah, um, I think it's uh, the, the, the advantage of technology in, in the way we can use it is that we can use it for pace and scale in the places where and scale is appropriate. And I think this allows us to really finesse and focus our face-to-face -face and our really critical re resources to, to people where we have to go door-to-door -door or we have to do some teaching. So we had the opportunity to speak with a lot of our volunteer health um, communities and they were able to sort of repurpose some of their adult education. Um, volunteers to do things around digital education. Um, there's a program, I'll leave it in the chat only because I can't remember, devices.now. Um, it's got a uh, post in England and also one in Scotland where you're able to um, collect old devices and repurpose them for people. Now that doesn't go all the way, but one of the features of the messaging system that we did is that we were able to work with our local councils for people that were having problems signing up. There were loads of people that had problems signing, signing up. We're looking at, you know, that distribution of who was able to use it and who wasn't able to use it, but we had a second resource in which was you know, our team will talk about uploading CSV files and being on the phone. So it didn't mean that everything went smoothly, but for the bulk of people where we could use the tech that allowed us to then focus the remainder of our resources. So I think we have to understand that. I know that in the rural areas that we did have a challenge with some of our SMS messages going through because we were that far north. But again, because we knew the ecosystem and the landscape, we were able to pinpoint that understand that it was an issue and work with our um, communications providers and cell phone providers to make that a non-issue. Um, so I think those were some things that, again, knowing our whole ecosystem allowed us to pin to make phone calls and go door to door. <laughs> That's great. Thank you both so much. All right. Um, thank you, Christy. And thank you again to our excellent speakers, Mia, Ajoma, and Natasha. That was awesome. I like really learned so much and I can't thank you enough for sharing. And again, to our special guest musician, Manuel Houston, who Rob's going to tell us more about. And finally, I just really want to thank everybody from the bottom of my heart. This was a wonderful experience and I'm just so glad to have been a part of it. And so with that, I'll kick it over to Morgan. Thank you all so much for joining. This is an incredible conversation today, and this has been an incredible 12 weeks. We are so appreciative of all of our speakers, of Ellen and everyone from Cooper Hewitt, and of all of our audience members. You guys are so inspiring and incredible. Now I'd like to send it to Rob so we can hear some more music. 
All right, everyone. Thank you so much again for joining us over these past 12 weeks. We've had so many amazing speakers and so many amazing participants. Uh, just the fact that you're here means you're all helpers and uh, you are some, some of the people who, who are going to make everything better for everybody in this world. Um, now, that being said, uh, here's a cheers to all of you. And I'm going to turn it over to Emmanuel, Manny Houston. He just finished up a show off Broadway called Forbidden Broadway, The Next Generation. Uh, he's originally from South Carolina, but he's coming to us from New York City. He's a multi-talented creator, and I couldn't think of any way better to finish off this incredibly creative uh, series that we put on than with some beautiful music. So thank you all so much. We love you. Let's continue these conversations moving forward on all the different platforms we're on. And Manny, take it Hi, away. What's up, guys? Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Once again, my name is Emmanuel Houston. I know we've been here for a little bit now, so I'm going to go ahead and what I'm going to do is take some of the ideas that you guys threw out in the chat, and I'm going to do a quick mashup for you all. Uh, I haven't planned it out yet. I was uh, thinking about it. I saw somebody say All Along the Watchtower. I saw somebody say Al Jarreau. I saw somebody say Stevie Wonder. Uh, so I'm going to go off of there and start with this Al Jarreau. The only song I think I know about Al Jarreau. Uh. Does anyone wanna go waltzing in the garden? Does anyone wanna go dance up on the roof? Uh, does anyone wanna go waltzing in the garden? Does anyone wanna go dance up on the roof? Here we go, big man. Just a small town girl, living in the 
Thank you. Have a good weekend. Thank you so much. Have a good summer. Thank you all. Bye bye. See you next time. Be well. Be safe.